This year has been a bigger roller coaster than pretty much any other in this save so far, especially as the board took matters into their own hands and tried to completely ruin our summer. Spirits are high in the Sirens camp as we prepare for what should be the biggest season of this save so far. We're engaging in some transfer business and all sorts of other goodies over on stream right now. So join us over there after you've caught up over here. The VODs all on the second channel, link in the description, and we move. We came into season 13 of Building a Nation with Sirens of Malta. Off the back of a very good year for the nation as a whole, lots of points were gained. We just didn't contribute as many to them as we could have done. And we hoped that if we could build ourselves up a little bit this year start to contribute a little bit more still get the help this could easily be the best season of the save so far and as it happens we've actually spent over 40 million pounds on transfers this season but some of that was forced on by the story I'm about to tell you. So buckle up. So at the end of last season's video, I actually pointed this out, that we were currently allegedly failing FFP. Now, we all knew that that actually wasn't the case. It's because the FM projections don't project you getting any prize money for Champions League or any prize money at all for that matter, it seems. So we were failing it by a tiny fraction of a margin, and it was failing to discount the fact that we were probably going to end up getting somewhere in the region of £30 million in prize money from the Champions League, thus making us totally financially stable. But unfortunately, the board use those projections to decide whether they're going to do silly bollocks. And their drink of choice, as far as silly nonsense went this summer, was this. Uh, they sold Tony Sunday out from underneath us. Probably one of the best players in the team who'd just been rejuvenated into a brand new role that was pretty much carrying our new tactical setup. Yeah. So basically, we were handling our outs as we always do. And I'm going to actually talk to you a little bit later about how we sort of, generally speaking, get players to agree to stay at the club. However, this is one of these things that you simply cannot prevent if the board take it out of your hands. And given the values of our players being very low, this is where the problem comes in. Because most of the time, we get relatively small bids for our players because the game doesn't value them as anything. Most of the time, the bids for Tony Sunday would have been around about four or five million. Barcelona just randomly whacked a, well, essentially, 55 million pound bid on the table. And the board went, oh, give us all the money. We didn't really need it but they were like no no we need to upset the entire squad so we, we really need to make sure that you're worse this year because we need money for something and lake houses presumably and that's what happened now obviously getting well essentially it's not actually 55 million it was like 40 up front most of which wasn't put in the wage in the in the actual budget uh we did manage to get an extra three million pounds off of a clause they will owe us another ten and a half million pounds when he plays 50 league games and given that he played 22 the first season already i suspect that that's not going to be long before we get that money too so it will end up coming to close to 60 million pounds which is obviously amazing but the level we're at and the squad that we have means that a player like this is literally irreplaceable. And that's the problem. You could, We could have a billion pounds in the bank. It wouldn't matter because we wouldn't be able to find a player at the level of Tony Sunday that would A, talk to us and actually be willing to sign for us and B, just find one in the first place. So you essentially have to sort of start again, find a stopgap player to cover the gap in the meantime who is never going to be at the same level and try to find a youngster that you can develop into that player. Now, we're normally doing that second part in the background all the time anyway, but sometimes you just get thrown into the situation. It's like on the site. It's like on the treaty save when we lost that striker Juliet to Manchester United for barely any money and it literally set us back five years. Now, he was a striker, Tony is a central midfielder and I felt that we've actually done a pretty good job at covering over this role this season, which we'll get into in a sec. So if any player was going to be lost, it's not the end of the world for us and I think we've coped okay, but you'd still much rather have one of the best players at the club still at the club. Such is life though. But he wasn't actually the only out we made this year. Ruben Siwane also left to join Paris Saint-Germain for eight and a half million pounds and the best thing about this is we have a clause in his contract i believe that means we get a 50 percent of next sale fee so there's potential to bring in that fee up to maybe 12 13 million if we can sell that who's he wanted by at the moment real madrid and barcelona oh imagine imagine if they sold him to real madrid or barcelona <laughs> We could probably earn like five, six million pounds off of that deal if it goes through already. That would be incredible. And the last major out was Seku Fafana, the 24-year-old Ivorian striker slash winger for 10.75 million to Al Duhail. Now, the main reason for this transfer is just that with other players being at the club now, Fafana's football fell off a he just fell off the radar this year. I believe at the point when we sold him, we'd only he'd only made three appearances and two of those were off the bench over the last year. He had that breakout season for us where he was banging in goals and then could barely score for the remaining two years. He just got phased down the squad by many other players and eventually we felt it was the right time to try and cash in. We were able to bid him up over the course of January, eventually accepted nearly £11 million. We do have a clause in his contract as well, which we may be able to sell for a million or two here. But it just keeps us financially stable right now. And as I have noticed, a little spoiler for you, I suppose, is that going into the summer of 2036, at the start of the summer, our 
player values didn't actually drop back down to zero again, basically. They started to creep up to a more reasonable level. So those are the outs. What did we then do with all that money? First thing we did was sign up a player that I showed you at the end of the last video, but I want to show him again. Juan Carlos Perez, the now Colombian international, a cat which he got almost immediately upon joining us. Uh, so that's why he's on £25,000 a week, has been electric this year. It took him a little while to settle in, but for £1.8 million, he has been fabulous. And it's for this reason that we didn't need people like Fafana anymore. Our next big signing was a signing again I told you about last time because he was on loan with us last year. Ever Espino joined us for £5.5 million from Nationale. And I think he's been just a stalwart at the back. It's exactly what we were looking for. He's just done a really, really good job with us. 15 caps for Uruguay, still only 20 years old. I've just really, really enjoyed him this year. And I think 5.5 was reasonable for the kind of quality we get, ignoring the value here because FM. On the other hand, a very good piece of business was this. Gonzalo Freitas, a free transfer Portuguese international goalkeeper. Now, we were on the fence about whether we wanted to move Richard Gakune on because he's been a good goalkeeper for us, but we did start to notice some mistakes creeping into his game. And when the opportunity came to sign Gonzalo on a free transfer, we basically bit the hand off basically. He was released by Boa Vista. We stepped in there, put him on £20,000 a week. He's been absolutely stunning. I'm going to tell you some of the things he's done later in the video because I have some stories about him, believe me. But for free, absolute bargain. Then, rather weirdly, we picked up Archie Brown on a free transfer from Antwerp. Basically, we were looking at players that have been released, and we still needed a little bit of depth cover for Palacio, because Jar, Jar had left the club. He wouldn't sign a new contract. Uh, we had John Montagno, but Mayhem Sultan, or Sultan of Mayhem, had gone out on loan to Zabar, who were going to be playing in Europe for us this year. So we desperately needed some cover. So we decided a one-year deal on Archie Brown on a free transfer, just to give us a bit of backup. Wasn't the worst idea in the world. He's joining Siska in the summer anyway, but for 14k for a year we were relatively okay with that actually scored four times for us this year so i actually think that's a relatively good piece of business from us just for one year but of course with the departure of tony sunday that left us with a enormous gap in the midfield because we didn't really have anyone that could truly do that defensive midfield role for us slightly further up that could be good on the ball pass a little bit good tackling and defensive attributes but whilst also having great work rate and stuff to really busy themselves around so we went on the hunt what we needed was a guy for now and a guy for the future and truthfully i believe we found both this is the guy for now ko nagai to be precise 24 year old japanese international with 23 caps for the national team and we were just sort of looking for players sort of similar to tony now obviously he's nowhere near the same level but he has the key attributes that we want for that role as a ball winning midfielder he can tackle he can mark and he's got good positioning he's got reasonable aggression but more importantly he has great stamina and work rate when playing as a ball winning midfielder on support we want him buzzing around trying to win the ball in good places and we felt that co was the guy for the time being at least so until we could bring someone through that could hopefully take over that mantle but it would take a few years but then just a couple of weeks later we decided to pull the trigger on what i believe long term is going to be the replacement for tony sunday and he just so happens to be our record signing this is gert gilet a belgian 19 year old belgian currently defensive midfielder but he is obviously being retrained to play further up the pitch now he's a bit of a raw talent at the moment we've paid 10 million up front with another five in add-ons to Ghent, which is 15 million pounds for a player and it's a risk to take and you know i love a risk on an overpriced belgian who's he wanted by out of interest that's a good sign. That's always a good sign when you see those kind of things on there. Now, obviously, he's not there yet, but he is only 19. He's got a resilient personality, unflappable media handling. The, the professionalism seems to be there. He trains relatively well. He trains usually trains quite well. I think he's just coming back from an injury, in fairness. He's only made a few appearances for us this year, but, you know, a goal, a couple of assists in the league for us as well. Not really what we want from him, but he's got the work rate. Stamina's reasonable. He just needs to work on some of his more defensive attributes, and I think hopefully he can eventually be the replacement to Tony Sunday. And you remember last year, I told you the story of Roy Fleming. Well, this was the year we finally got to find out if Roy Fleming was going to be any good when he joined us. Yeah, 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 he actually is. He actually is. He signed for us at 18, obviously, in October last year, and Oh, wow. He actually, he actually went down to four-star PA for a little bit, but now it's back up again, which is fabulous. He genuinely is a brilliant player. Now, you'll note that he's now declared for England, which is a pain in the ass. Has actually been capped at under 20 levels. I don't think he's ever going to be an England international, but I also think there's very little chance of him redeclaring for Anguilla. What I actually suspect is going to happen with Roy Fleming is that because he's already been in Malta for ages, he can declare for Malta by the age he's like 20, maybe 21 at a push. So there's a very strong chance, I suspect, that Roy Fleming may end up declaring for Malta in the future and might be the type of guy on an international level that could actually do some stuff for the Maltese national team of all things. Next up is Miguel Torres, £350,000 from, uh, who was that? Uh, 3 de Febrero, uh, which I believe is a Paraguayan side. I mean, he is Paraguayan after all. He's actually gone on loan to Sweetie. Uh, now, for some reason, this is, I don't know why that is. He's two star, three enough. I think he's two star, four star. Needless to say, he's a fantastic player. And to get him out on loan to Sweetie, I was very, very happy with indeed. We were completely unsure as what we wanted to do with him when he joined us, particularly with the low self-belief personality. But we felt for the best that 
he could just go out on loan, hopefully develop there, and we'll just sort of see what kind of player he becomes out on loan at a club like Sweetie, which is uh, more on them in a minute. But I think that's good business for 350 grand, especially as we went a little bit mad in January with some players we'd had shortlisted for a few years that were actually now willing to talk to us. The first of which was Adrian Rodriguez, who's also gone out on loan to Sweetie. But look at the quality of player now that we're actually being able to loan out. Five million pounds from Defensia, sorry, Defensa e Justicia, and he's just so well-rounded. And having these kind of guys out on loan, I think he's going to be an absolute godsend to clubs like Sweetie. And the fact that we're able to get these kind of quality players out when they're of this level already, with in theory some room to grow as well, they could make huge impacts for this club later down the line, either for us or if they stay on loan, I'm excited about them. But the player, one of the players I'm most excited about this season is this chap here, Juraj Luhovi. Um, we've been looking at him for a little while. He has now got a cap for Slovakia, but look, ignoring the potential for a second, he may be one of these guys that just has really high CA because he's played lots of games from an early age or just came in with quite high CA but doesn't have the ceiling perhaps but his attributes are sensational for the level he's already playing at he's a model citizen as well which means if there's any chance of him having high PA he may well reach it uh, great acceleration great pace 17 crossing which is unbelievable his mentals are superb we paid 1.6 million pounds to Slovan Bratislava for him and he is now firmly the backup to Julian Palacio on that left hand side which is why Archie Brown we were more than happy to let him go I think this guy might well be the real deal in the future still only 19 years old he is the more i look at him the more i'm convinced that he's actually going to be an, a genuine monster in the future and i'm so happy that we've got him already um he's already got up i think half a star in his ca so far upon being and he's got good on both feet he's just absolutely wild then there was eric nunez from saprisa in costa rica we do like a costa rican international and we were looking for a little bit more depth to have behind the likes of Padilla, uh, Padilla and diaz as far as our tracatista in the more deep role goes and i feel like he fits the bill relatively well for a million quid there was a release clause as well we were willing to take a punt and i think we've done okay he's got reasonable speed okay temples he lacks that finishing ability but then diaz scores loads of goals and he's got like six finishing so I, apparently it doesn't even matter that much i'm hoping he could become at least a solid player for us even even though it's a slightly like he's 21 now which means that he's going to have less chance to develop than some of the other guys but i still think there's a great player here and lastly we have benjamin sotelo a, a chilean argentinian player from colo colo now the only reason we really signed this guy genuinely was because he was available and he had a release clause that was 3.6 million pounds he was also wanted by paris Saint Germain, and all of those factors made us go you know what if we get this guy now there's every chance that we could build him up a little bit and then flip him for 10 million pounds in a season or two because the fact is though he's very very good he he's really he's not as good as, as Perez but I still think he's a fabulous player and does give us some nice depth there now he's not actually scored a goal for us yet as he did join us very very late indeed but I still think he's an excellent player and maybe there's just a good profit margin on him in the future not on huge money and for 3.6 million I don't think we could really say no so you can see that we've done some I genuinely think some fabulous business this year with some of the cheaper players we've picked up I think we picked up some good players for the loan farm some good guys for the future and a couple of guys that actually play for us now and that's always really a massive help and obviously some of the stuff when he was in World War II was a uh like um, a motor torpedo boat, like in the navy. He wasn't the he wasn't the motor torpedo boat. <laughs> he had this image of my granddad being like an anthropomorphized boat. <laughs> so there's some questions on the last video, and a lot of people had this, and I said I would explain about how we sort of hang on to some of our better players. I, I realised that there is a an element of irony to this, doing this on an episode where we've quite literally lost one of our best players. But there's nothing you can really do about that other than protesting or having a boat clause but this is why i think it's important to sometimes take a year off a player's contract and dump in a one-year extension for you because it will actually allow you to bypass them being sold to other clubs like that because if you trigger the clause it does cancel the transfer deal at least one time it's it's something to work on or it's certainly used to anyway i wish i actually had a first-hand example of the exact way that we hold on to players but i'm going to try and explain it as best i can do and hopefully you'll understand because i think sometimes people just think that when a club comes in and a player gets upset with you and you have that discussion you just kind of have to let them go or piss them off there are ways around it but you do need the right squad structure and hierarchy to make it happen. So the first thing you're going to want to do all the time is stall the offer. Um, that will allow other offers to come in for other players to give you a choice of how you manipulate things. So just go to the right clicky thing in the bottom corner and stall the offer. So once it's stalled and you've got a few offers on the table, eventually the stalling offers are going to come around and you're going to have to reject them. And it will say like they're going to be unsettled or they desperately want to leave, etc. So what you're going to want to do firstly is go through and look at the squad status in the hierarchy screen, i.e. over here on the dynamics, to find where the player that you're going to say no to sets in. So if you've got, say, four offers on players, because you might well do, we often have like seven or eight on different players at any one time. Look in here 
media and find a guy who's either a team leader or a highly influential player. You can get it with influential players too, but the higher up, the better. The personalities of the players can also matter. So if they've got bad personalities, this may not work as well. But generally speaking, go into that menu where you talk to the player and say, you're a highly influential player and I want to keep you, or you're a team leader or you're an influential player. Generally speaking, one of those. Usually, I would say nine times out of 10, that will keep the player at the club. And you could pretty much do that with any player who has that kind of rating as well. However, some players that are further down, maybe they're only influential or they're other, it will be more difficult to keep them because you can't say that to them. And this is why it's important to make sure that you piss off one of these guys first briefly. That way you can bring them around to you again using that discussion. So you've now got them to agree to stay. So with the other guys, when they come in, and this will work with these guys as well, there's another option that will appear once you've got one player to successfully stay. And that will say something like, um, for an example, Pierre Camgren Lend came to me a few weeks ago and he then agreed to stay. You click that option and a lot of the time the player will then be like, well, I like that guy, therefore I'm going to stay as well. Now, sometimes that will matter depending on which social group that player is in. If the guy is in the same social group as the player that you've already got to stay, that's sometimes a factor. doesn't always work like that. But generally speaking, by making sure that you upset the right guy first, you can sort of like domino effect your way through the squad it won't work every time we still end up with two or three players pissed off every year there are some guys like quasi awua for example that no matter what we do he will always get upset with me but then i just annoy him for a month and eventually the interest gets dropped when the window shuts and then he's happy again <laughs> which is why long-term contracts are so important but that's basically how we generally speaking keep players at the club for the most part so tactically this year we've been persisting with that same tactical approach from last year where we got rid of our dm moved the ball winner into midfield and then played with a second uh trecortista essentially as that advanced midfield role and the main reason that we did this in the end is that I was noticing essentially that in those games we were creating some good chances but we weren't creating a high quantity of them and we were getting very unlucky with our opposition's opportunities because they were just scoring every chance they got basically and I decided that we needed to do some of that ourselves so one of the things I like about this new tactical approach is that it allows us more opportunities to get lucky by having more openings we're going to get luckier goals more often because we're shooting more often and we're just going to in theory create more opportunities by doing that in general but that seems to be the the logic that I'm applying now in football that probably doesn't always work all the time but in FM that does seem to be a way to go because in the league we won the league by 14 points and that's not really a huge shout. Like we've won the league by relatively large margins in the past. It's the, well, you'll note the, the plus 96 goal difference. Uh, we had a season. We scored 112 goals this year, which is 22 more than we've ever scored before. Our record was 90 prior to this year, and we scored 112. Also only conceded 16. So not only was it strong defensively, we had several games. I think there was five matches this year where our opponents didn't even have a shot. And they're good teams, after all. And we were absolutely battering teams. We had an 8 and a 9 nil win at various moments this season, including against good sides. Uh, not Tarshin. <laughs> More importantly, not Tarshin, who didn't win a single match all season. Hammering still easily the second best side. They are slipping a little bit, but they're still very much clear of everybody else fairly comfortably. Uh, Balzan, with a few of their youth... Uh, sorry, with a few of their youth. With a few of their youngsters on loan from us, actually managed to get into the Conference League in third place this year. You'll note that Sweet E United uh, are in the Europa League, despite being fourth. Now, the reason for that is because both us and Hammering got knocked out of the cup. Uh, not on purpose, I should add. We actually lost two Tarshin Rainbows. But as a result, Sweetie ended up going all the way to the cup final where they did win it. Now, I want to show you the past positions briefly on this. This is them after the 12th of January. They were sitting 10th in the league. At that point, we loaned them because they just wanted three of our midfielders. And oh baby, did they take off in the second half of the year, going all the way up to fourth in the league. They would have qualified for Europe outright anyway. But now I'm very, very glad that they won the cup because they look like they've got some real strength. Valletta and Floriana up from the second tier will be back in the top flight next year. Unfortunately, our affiliate side Pembroke didn't do so well there. Uh, at one point, Dingley were actually in sixth place and looking like a promotion push. Fell off a little bit though. We hoped to build the Dingley Swallows up though one day. Which brings us to us and European football. Now, in each of the last two seasons, I think it's fair to say we've been a bit naff. After that brilliant breakout year where we came eighth, got to the uh, round of 16 of the Champions League. Everything looked amazing. It's been kind of downhill since then. However, this year, we hoped with the slight tactical tweaks that we could try to get a bit of luck on our side and just play a little bit better. However, very, very weirdly indeed, we were supposed to go in at the second round of qualifying for the Champions League, as we have done uh, every season since pretty much the first year of the save, I think, other than that. Uh, however, sometimes this happens in FM, and this definitely happened a couple of times with MTK. You randomly get given a buy, except this year we got given two of the damn things, and it meant that we went in at the playoff round of the Champions League qualifiers, which you might think, oh, that's a good thing. It means you don't have to worry about the qualifiers. Yeah, except you don't get the po coefficient points for winning those qualifiers. So we missed out on two full coefficient points for not slapping about some team from Estonia. Little bit annoying, that. But that catapulted us straight into the playoff round where we would face Ludogorets. We made fairly light work of things. 
3-0 win in the away match. Two goals from Eva Espino as well. We'd really been working on trying to get some set pieces going a little bit as we felt that could give us an edge in certain matches. And, well, it proved to be exactly that. One for Diaz, two for Espino. Cracking. Second leg was a relatively solid performance as well. Henry Watara with the goal. Freitas was mad at the match, which we'd love to see. A 4-0 win on aggregate and through to the main stage of the thing. And then this is where things got weird. We got given probably the toughest set of draws or like matches I've ever had since it went to the big group format. Every single one of the eight teams that we would play were from England, Spain, Italy, France, and Germany. Not a single team from outside of those nations we would play in the eight matches we got, which is crazy. But we started off with the perfect result. Kona Guy scored on his debut, I think, for the club. And then Melman gave us a 2-0 advantage before Patrick uh, Bioash got on back for Juve. Now, Full disclosure, clearly you can see they were the better side on the night. It took a long time for them to get going in this game. Uh, they didn't really start kicking off in this one until about the 70th minute, but they did have some good chances late on, which Freitas was able to save. Uh, obviously, they scored the one, and we were fortunate. But this is what I mean about just having these opportunities. I feel like with our old style of play, we'd have limited Juve to, a less, to less opportunities in that game, but we'd have also created probably about nothing and would have lost probably 1-0. And that's the thing. We're putting ourselves in positions to get a bit more lucky sometimes, and it's nice to have things go our way a little bit. It was no luck necessary, though, as we hosted Eintracht. Funk for up next and a 4-0 hammering with goals from what well, first an own goal then Melman Watara with the penalty and then Archie Brown made it 4-0 and suddenly we looked a lot lot better lots more creativity in this types of matches Frankfurt are not a muggy team by any means they just won the Europa League as well beating Bayern in the final last season so this was a really strong performance and to see us get two for two suddenly confidence was flowing which then compounded even more as we traveled to Spain and humped Villarreal 5-0 and then we were really starting to feel confident about our new style of play especially as we got a red card in this game and it didn't even slow us down. We still scored two more goals after the red card. Watara with a goal, Nagai with another, and two off the bench for Jose Padilla after we changed the system because of the red card was enough to give us a 5-0 hammering of Villarreal. Three wins out of three, looking brilliant. And then it got even better. Two all draw at home against Manchester City. Again, the luck was on our side. City missed a penalty in this one. Freitas saved it. A massive penalty save off of Erling Haaland. Um, and now as it happens, they scored the equaliser in this game immediately after the penalty anyway. Um, but it didn't matter because it was enough to keep us in this match and earned us a very fortunate two all draw at home against Manchester City. But again, we created more chances in this game. You can see we let in way more opportunities than normal and just put some trust in our goalkeeper to actually keep us at bay. And he did so. So again, fortunate, but it's better from us. Now it was at this point that AFCON happened and it wasn't as big of an impact on us as it had been in previous years where we lost a lot of our first 11 um, including Tony Sunday as it goes but this year we still lost 14 players to AFCON and in amongst that also got three injuries to our goalkeepers leaving us on our fourth choice keeper and all that compounded for a little bit of bad luck for us for once a two all draw at home against Lyon where despite the sort of rotated squad with Bernd Wisniewski in goal who did not have a good game unfortunately but then fourth choice keeper what can you do we did unfortunately not get the result we should have won the match but you know statistically we created the opportunities that's all I really care about and we got lucky elsewhere but you'll know the 98 the 89th minute penalty was scored by Roy Fleming his first goal for the club on his first appearance for us in the Champions League and it wasn't like we gave it to him for no reason he'd come off the bench in this match and he was genuinely the best penalty taker slash finisher composure that was left on the pitch he deserved to take the penalty he scored it and he earned us the point we then completed our run of Afghan absentees against Stade Rene away from home and got the result again so to take four points from those when possibly we should have even taken six I think is good and it shows the strength that we've now got when not having to rely so much on players that are going to be missing from time to time a Gonzalo Diaz hat trick from that deeper trek role was absolutely crucial for us in this game we we did just about deserve the win, I would say, and that's the most important thing. Burnt did a slightly better job in this game, but still gave up a bit of a few soft ones. Basically, Diaz just carried us through this one, but that was another point, and an sorry, another three points, another win, still unbeaten with two matches to go. But our next game was Bayern Munich, but we knew that if we could beat Bayern Munich, we would then officially qualify top eight with a game to spare on 17 points. So of course we went and bloody did it. Sirens three, Bayern Munich two, another penalty save for Gonzalo Freitas in this. Perez gave us the lead early, on in this one. Quasi added another before Warren Zaya Emery got on back. We actually started very, very strongly in this game. Um, then Bayern really threw a lot at us in the second half. Had an amazing opportunity. It did also help them that their goal was literally a tap-in as well. That Emery won. I think he counted for like 0.85 XG because it was basically on the goal line after a poor mistake from a defender. Um, again, we got fortunate in this game, but we were there to take our chances and once again trusted the goalkeeper to make the saves. We scored every shot on target. We're doing what other teams were doing to us now to other teams that being said did score this absolute banger tell you what we might have a short free kick routine on here look at where quasi is he's just gonna shoot of course oh no he's gone short imagine <laughs> oh my god 
In our last game, we went away to Inter, weren't able to get the result on the night in the end. Still had some good opportunities in this game, weren't able to take them. Uh, Eliwahi got the goal, made it 1-0. It was our first defeat in Europe in the entire season, but we were already qualified, so we didn't care. Because in the end, we ended up fifth. Um, if we had managed to get that win, we could have come second. But fifth place, 17 points. It's a record for us, our best ever season in the Champions League as far as the group stage goes. And that shows you the quality we've got. But that, of course, meant that we got a bye to the round of 16, and we'd get to face one of the sides that we'd at least get a prefer preferable draw. And that draw was Dortmund. Dortmund. And we went to Dortmund and did what I would consider a very professional job. Gonzalo Freitas, once again, man of the match for us in this one. Only made four saves, but they were good saves that needed to be made. Um, it was a day for goalkeepers, really. I think we were slightly the better side, and that really was a big sign for us, given that we were actually missing a couple of players for this game as well. Couldn't quite get the goal over the line, but we felt at home we'd have a chance. And would you believe it, we actually went and did it. Now, we didn't deserve it, uh, because ironically, we played much worse in the home game. The game was very tight until the 69th minute, when Jamie Bino Gittens gave Dortmund the lead. They then added a second one in the 75th minute. It was all going a little bit wrong. And then we just threw some stuff at them. Vida scored in the 80, uh, the 78th minute. Julian Palacio, both the wingbacks, of course, scored the goal to get us level out of nowhere before Henry Watara in extra time gave us the lead. And then look, Uri Lehovoy in the 118th minute wrapped it up. Three of our four goals were scored by wingbacks in this game. I don't know how, I don't know why, but it was enough to see us through to the quarterfinals, again fortuitously. And for the first time in the club's history, we'd won a knockout stage of the Champions League. We would face a team we'd played before in the knockouts, though, Arsenal. And it did not go well. Uh, we kind of got what was coming to us. Once again, though, Freitas saved a penalty in this match. That was his third penalty save in the Champions League. I think he's actually saved every penalty he's faced this season, which is absolutely wild. But needless to say, uh, Kareem Kanate, much like last time, just tore us apart. He's just much better than us. Um, we offered nothing in this game. The injury to Nagai wasn't great either. That meant he would miss the second leg. It we just weren't good enough yet. But despite that, we're still able to come up with this. A 2-1 victory in the home game. We did go out by five goals to two. So what? But like, frankly, so what? We actually played off, or in some ways played Arsenal off the park in the second leg here and showed that we had the quality to beat a team like Arsenal. Diaz and Watara with the goals here. It's just nice to show that once again, we are actually capable of beating these sorts of teams. We're just growing slowly but surely each season. It now feels like we're actually onto something and starting to get a lot more goals going forward. It's just really exciting times for us. So with us finally stepping up in Europe and doing something, it was time to get a little help from our friends to get rid of that 4.5 season and replace it with something a little bit more respectable. First up were last year's surprise package, Zabar, who made light work of North Macedonian side. Skendia to progress through to the next round, but then they would face Austrian side Lask. Unfortunately, they were simply too strong and Zabar bowed out here, but at least they'd got us a couple of coefficient points along the way. Next up were Goodyear, who were frankly due a big group appearance. They also entered in the second round and drew against Georgian side Torpedo uh, Kutaisi. They were able to get the result over two legs, despite making it a little bit more difficult for themselves, but their reward was a tie against Istanbul Basak Shahir. Why can't we get some nice early... Just give us an easy draw for once, just please, FN. They won the home leg, but were unable to get it over the line in Turkey and also bailed out at the third round, which just left Hamrun in the Europa League. They kicked things off with a bang against Bodo. Despite losing a classic 4-3 in Norway, they were able to get the win 3-1 at home to progress 6-5 on aggregate to the third round of the Europa League qualifiers, where they would face Elfsborg of Sweden. Unfortunately, this proved to be a little bit of a step too far, as they did lose both legs and were dumped down into the Conference League playoff round. But we still had hope, as this is how they'd qualified in the past. And they would face Czech side Sigma Olomuc. And I'm sorry, if I've pronounced that wrong, but they haven't been in Europe for quite some time. I think they'd only done one season of Europe in this entire save, so we had high hopes. And then this happened. Uh, they lost the away leg, then won the home leg by the same scoreline, and then went out on penalties. Uh, the worst thing about it was they conceded in the 87th minute of that home leg, and if it wasn't for that, they would have just progressed through a normal time, no problem, straight to the group stage. It was gut-wrenching. For a team that had reached the knockouts and won every game in the group stage last year, to not even reach the damn thing this year, it's just the inconsistency is absolutely, like infuriating, but that's just life. We actually thought that was a really good draw for them, and they just couldn't get it over the line. It sucks. But in better news, despite our relatively poor season, you might say, like, what do we get in the end? 8.875 is not good compared to the 13s and the 12s. It, it really, really isn't. And that's what happens when you don't have help. But it is still a gain over the 4.7. In fact, it's a gain of four points. And that actually pushes us up by a few more points. We actually go up three more places despite a relatively awful year. Up to 12th place in the coefficients. We leapfrog Scotland, Turkey, and Belgium in one season. So, youth intake. Um, this genuinely was the worst youth intake we've had in this entire set. It, there was nothing 
worth speaking about. However, I had some questions about the youth and tape player we got a few years ago that actually looked decent, Matthew Side. And because he's obviously been on loan for a long time, we kind of forget about him. So I figured we'd do a checkup. So here he is. He's been on loan at Goodyear now for the past four seasons. And you can see that he's developed into a very stable footballer. Like he's never going to be a world beater, obviously. He's currently rated at two star CA, but he's played what? Nearly 90 league matches for Goodyear, played in Europe for them, scored winning goals for them in Europe. And his attributes are genuinely quite decent. Physically, he's good. He's 6'5", good on both feet. Mentals are developing nicely. He's not the most technically gifted, but he can tackle and do a few things. He's also got 22 caps for Malta at the age of 21. For me, there's 100 caps in him easily, and I'm very excited about him. He probably is still the best Maltese youth talent that's come through in this entire save, and probably will do in many ways. I'd be very surprised if we see anyone better than him come through, and that really does tell you something, doesn't it? Moving over to statistics now. So um, I want to sort of let you know about more of the stats, because I realize this is like a giant screen, and some people said that it was unclear about what I was referencing, so I'm going to try to explain a little bit more this time. So goal scoring, obviously, was all about quasi, like 25 and Perez with 25. Uh, Quasi especially, though, overperformed his XG massively, whereas Perez was just a little bit over, but he was getting the chances. Quasi has firmly overtaken Melman now as the starting Trecortista on the right, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, he also creates a lot of assists, like 13 assists this year. His XA per 90, his expected goals per 90 minutes, is also, sorry, expected assists, is, I think, the highest of any player in the club that actually consistently plays, which is amazing. Melman, you can see, again, underperformed quite a fair bit, and that's why we need to look to maybe, not move him on, because he's such a useful player, but he's very much a second choice. As for assists, Vida got 11, but then he looked further down. Palacio only got five this year. Uh, Luhovoy, despite playing like literally half the number of minutes of him, actually got four assists. And it's worth looking at the XA per 90 on some of these players as well, uh, particularly the wingbacks. You'll see here, Vida's always the benchmark at 0.44. You'll see Krastev, 0.47. He's finally starting to put up numbers now. That means that I'm not sure how much longer Vida's got of being our starting right back. I think Evtim Krastev could be him maybe by the end of next season. Certainly the season after, I think, at this rate. He's definitely given him for a run for his money and on the left hand side which is always slightly lower on that side of things you can see palacio at 0.31 and then lahovi at uh, well 0.27 he's not far off of palacio as well which gives us good hope so just shifting gears into how the team sort of lined up this season so i can take you into a few of the players profiles obviously we showed you perez earlier and you already see his goals uh Watara hasn't really played all that much this season i mean he's got 19 appearances eight goals which isn't too bad but he has also taken six penalties uh in that time and he's actually missed half of them as well which is crazy padilla has been astonishingly good again this year um just a really useful bit part player can play as like he's not quite ready to be starting consistently but he's growing into that being an option for us because he can play in both the striker role and behind the striker as well like eight goals and seven assists this year he's happy where he is as well which is really really good i love him Vida, you can see his attributes really haven't changed uh much in the last sort of if you just look at say the last three years you can see that there's mostly been like the occasional bit on things that aren't really that important a few mental attributes have changed but nothing too drastic because again he's probably maxed out his ca which means that it's only a matter of time for me until crash overtakes him some big developments though i feel like mateus paez has really emerged this year with 34 appearances i think we might start to see some good tactical development now it's only been a year but long throws have gone up which is very important uh three up on decisions as well which is very interesting cardio also continues to develop if we just look at him over the course of the last year that marking going up penalty taking as well uh positioning going up even further we really have seen really nice increases of him across the board other than his determination weirdly Palacio just to show you him again like he's dropped off a big five stars there but that just changes all the time I think he's fabulous I think he might be maxed out as well potentially but it doesn't even matter I think he's to me he's world class and I suppose we should check in on Krastev you can see that yeah okay he's not quite on Vida's level in other areas yet but I think he's definitely developing and when you look at his attribute development over say I think it's a two-year spell we've got with him dribbling's gone up a little bit uh anticipation's up by three lots of good mental gains uh actually a slight drop in overall physical ability which is surprising uh, I must admit I'm not sure why that's the case might just take a bit of time I don't know maybe we haven't got the biggest sample size yet on Krastev but I'm excited about him and he does look to be developing really nicely now whether he's got the ceiling that's that much beyond Vida I don't know know, but I'm excited about him. But the Maltese national team has been a bit of a weird year because it's obviously qualifiers and whatnot. Uh, 158th in the world now. They're doing okay. Over the course of the last year, it's not gone well for them. Uh, it's Euro qualifiers. They had a very, very tough group. You can see they've not managed to win a game over the course of the last year. Came bottom of their qualifying group. Didn't do amazingly well. Did take a draw with, who was it? Uh, North Macedonia and Turkey. Turkey, that's quite a good draw that, but it's not quite there yet. Now to the loan farm. Oh, get ready. We're at negative 59 loans, uh, which if I remember correctly, is minus is 196 loans which is an unhinged amount and it's more than i've ever had now i must admit some of them were just us stat padding essentially by shoving a load of guys that were not really that good to some of our affiliate clubs just to see if we could help them out a little bit um 
But that's not really the point. We still have an insane amount of loans, more than I've ever had at any stage ever uh, on FM. Now, just looking at some of the, and it's not just all bad loans either. When you look at the potential of some of the loans we've got out now, that's how many players have got like three and a half star minimum. And that's a lot of guys. And when you look at some of the clubs they're at, Hammer have got one. Melita still actually have one, surprisingly. Um, stayed up this year. But look at this. Sweetie, one, two there, a third one there, another one, and another one there. Like they've got five, arguably even six guys who have mad potential to do something for them, which is why I believe that they're going to be an absolutely crucial team in the coming years. Like, top goal scorer this season was once again Armando Perez. That's 32 goal, goal, goal contributions. He just scores goals, basically. Jean Dong suck as well. With Look at that. 25 appearances for 31 goal contributions. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, when I tried to extend his loan this summer, they said no. Not him. They didn't extend it. Now, I'm hoping I still get an opportunity to make that happen because it would suck if they lost him, of all people, given that he is quite literally the single best player that is currently out on loan at another moment side and it would be absolutely catastrophic if for some reason he came back financially as well we've got 63 million pounds in the bank now thanks to the sales prize money and just being quite sensible with our cash we've got more money to come in soon with the other clauses because tony sundays they still owe us another 10.5 million pounds which they will probably pay us at the end of next season so more money to come in for that as well it's exciting times so we've got good players they're actually starting to be worth a little bit more now like our base values for a lot of players in the summer started being more like 5 million instead of 800k which means that we can stagger them up if we were trying to sell someone we might actually be able to get a little bit more decent cash over the course of this summer so i wouldn't be surprised if we come back next year and i'm saying hey it's 100 million in the bank because you genuinely never know what sort of mad bids coming from Saudi over the course of the summer. So simply our aim for season 14 is very, very an easy one. It's try to do what we did in the Champions League last year. Now, I feel like we did get lucky in quite a few games last season, so I don't know if that happens again. Or maybe our tactic just creates opportunities for us to get lucky, and we will keep doing it whilst also improving the squad so it doesn't matter so much a lot of the time. And with five teams in Europe, I really believe that this is we're going to have us do well and another Maltese club do well next year. And I'm predicting that we're going to have two teams in the group stages next year, uh, both in the Conference League. I reckon Hammerin and Sweetie both get in the Conference League group. And uh, my prediction is we get 14 points next year. I've said this a few times, but I'm really hoping I can manifest it so if you have enjoyed the video drop a like that would be fantastic if you're new to the channel subscribe that'd be glorious as well i do have an agent video coming out for you it's already been out on the patreon I just had some issues with getting a thumbnail sorted for it um because my thumbnail guy had some uh, computer issues so hopefully this one isn't got a crappy thumbnail that's been done by me but you'll probably be able to tell if that is the case but needless to say that is coming soon uh, i'll see you guys very very soon hold your gun capybara bye bye